is deeply impressed about how much we already learned about space, about the universe, and um, yeah, about our, our place in the universe, our solar system. But the next speakers will explain us how we can use computational methods to simulate the universe and actually grow planets. Um, the speakers will be Anna Penslin. She is a PhD student in computational astrophysics in Tübingen. And Caroline Kimmich, she is physics master student at Heidelberg University. And the talk um, is entitled Grow Your Own Planet, How Simulations Help Us Understand the Universe. Thank you. So, hi everyone. It's a cool animation, right? And the really cool thing is that there's actually physics going on there. So this object could really be out there in space, but was created on a computer. So this is how a star is forming, how our solar system could have looked like in the beginning. Thank you for being here and that you're interested in how we make such an animation. Anna and I are researchers in astrophysics, and we're concentrating on how planets form and evolve. She's doing her PhD in tubing, I'm doing my master's in Heidelberg. And in this talk, we want to show you a little bit of physics and how we can tra translate that in such a way that a computer can calculate it. So let's ask a question first. What is the universe? Or what's in the universe? The most part of the universe is something we don't understand yet. It's dark matter and dark energy. And we don't know what it is yet. And that's everything we cannot see in this picture here. What we can see are stars and galaxies. And that's what we want to concentrate on in this talk. But if we can see it, why would we want to watch a computer well, everything in astro astronomy takes a long time. So each of these tiny specks you see here are galaxies, just like ours. This is how the Milky Way looks like. And we're living in this tiny spot here. And as you all know, our Earth takes one year to orbit around the Sun. Now think about how long it takes for the Sun to orbit around the center of the galaxy. It's 400 million years. And even the star formation is 10 million years. We cannot wait 10 million years to watch how a star is forming, right? That's why we need computational methods or simulations on a computer to understand these processes. So when we watch to the night sky, what do we see? Of course, we see stars and those beautiful nebulas. They are gas and dust. And all of these images are taken with Hubble Space Telescope. Oh. So there's one image that doesn't belong in there. But it looks very similar, right? This gives us the idea that we can describe the gases in the universe as a fluid. It's really complicated to describe the gas in every single particle. So we cannot track every single molecule in the gas that moves around. It's way easier to describe it as a fluid, so remember that for later, we will need that. But first, let's have a look how a star forms. A star forms from a giant cloud of dust and gas. Everything moves in that cloud. So eventually, more dense regions occur, and they get even denser. And these clumps can eventually collapse to one star. So this is how a star forms. They collapse due to a, their own gravity. And in this process, a disk forms. And in this disk, planets can form. So why a disk? As I said, everything moves around in the cloud. So it's likely that the cloud has a little bit of an initial rotation. As it collapses, this rotation gets larger and faster. And now you can think of making a pizza. So when you make a pizza and spin your dough on your finger, you get a flat disk like a star, like a disk around a star. 
That's the same process, actually. In this disk, we have dust and gas. From this dust in the disk, the planet can form. But how do we get from tiny little dust particles to a big planet? Well, it somehow has to grow, and grow even further and compact till we have rocks, and even grow further until we reach planets. How does it grow? Well, that dust grows, we know that. At least that's what I observed when I took those images in my flat. <laughs> well, so dust can grow, and grow even for further and compact. But when you take two rocks, we are now at this, in this stage. When you take two rocks and throw them together, you do not expect them to stick, right? You expect them to crash and crack into a thousand pieces. So we're standing on the proof that planets ex exist. How does this happen? And it's not quite solved yet in, in research. So this is a process that is really hard to observe because planets are very, very tiny compared to stars, and even stars are only small dots in the night sky. Also, as I said, planets form in a disk, and it's hard to look inside the disk. So this is why we need computation to understand the process, the, how planets form, and other astronomical processes. So let's have a look at how we simulate it on a computer. Okay, so uh, somehow we have uh, seen nature, it's beautiful and it's just like a, a tank of water and a bubbly fluid we already have. So now we have this bubbly fluid in, here in the middle demonstrated, but now we have to teach our computer to deal with the bubbly fluid and that's way too much single molecules to simulate them, as we already said. So there are two ways to discretize it in a way that we just look at smaller pieces. One is uh, the Lagrangian description, just like taking uh, small bubbles or balls uh, of material that have a fixed mass. They have a certain velocity that varies between each particle and they have, of course, a momentum because they have a velocity and a mass. And we create a number of those particles and then just see how they move around and how they uh, collide with each other. That would be one way. Um, that was described last year in a very good talk. I can highly recommend to hear this talk if you're interested in this method. Uh, however, there's a second way to also describe this, not just going with the flow of the particles, but we are a bit lazy, we just box it. So we create a grid, um, as you see down here, in this grid, you have a certain filling level, a, a bit of a slope, how, so what's, uh, what's the trend there? And then um, we just look for each box, what flows in, what flows out through the surfaces of this box, and then we have a volume and, or a mass filled within this box. And this is uh, how we discretize what is going on in the disk. And actually, since we are usually in the system of a disk, we do not do it in this nice uh, box way like this, but we use boxes like those because they are already almost like a disk and we just keep exactly the same boxes all the time and then you just measure what goes through the surface in these boxes. So this is how these two methods look like if you compute with both of them. So they, one was done by me, I'm usually using this boxing method, and the other was done by my colleague. Um, you see this, like, when you look at them, at the colors, at the structure, here you have the slope inwards, you have the same slope inwards here, you have e even this hilly structure here, the same here, but what you notice is you have these enlarged dots that are really, these are really the mass particles we saw before, these bubbles, and here you have this inner cutout. This is because when you create this grid, you have a very uh, a, a region at the inner part of the dis disk where the boxes become tinier and tinier, and, well, we can't compute that. So we have to cut out at some point the inner part. So here, um, when you go to low densities, these 
bubbles blow up and distribute their mass over a larger area, so it's not very accurate for these areas. And here we have the problem, we can't calculate the inner area. So both methods have their uh, pros and cons and, and are valid. Uh, but now, for most, we will focus on this one. Just um, so we have this nice, actually, stream uh, features. So again, going back to the boxes, um, uh, we have to measure the flow between the boxes. This flow, in, in physics, we call it flux. And we have a density, row one, a density, row two. And the flux is the description of what mass moves through the surface here from one box to the next. So if we write this in math terms, uh, it looks like this. This says um, the time derivative of the density, meaning the change in the, uh, this, the, the change over time. So how much faster or slower you go, that velocity would be a change in time. And then this weird triangle symbol, it's called nabla, is a, a positional derivative. Uh, so it's like a slope. So how much, how do we change our position, um, actually? So if we change, look at the density over time, it should correlate to what um, inflow we have over position. That is what that says. So, and then we have in physics a few principles that we have always to obey because it's just almost common sense. One of them is, well, if we have mass in a box, well, it, like this, the mass should not go anywhere unless someone takes it out. So if we have a closed box and mass in that box, nothing should disappear magically. We should stay. It should all stay in this box, so even if these particles jump around in our box with a certain velocity, it's the same number of particles in the end. That's, again, the same equation, just um, told in math. So, um, a second very rudimentary principle is if we have energy in a, in a completely closed box, so, for example, these nice chemicals here, and we have a certain temperature, so in this case, our temperature is low, maybe like outside, uh, uh, around zero degree uh, Celsius, and then we have these nice chemicals down here, and at some point they react very heavily. We suddenly end up with much less chemical energy and a lot more thermal energy, uh, but overall, the complete energy uh, summed up here, like the thermal and the chemical energy, also the uh, energy of uh, the movement and the energy of uh, potential uh, added up to this variable u, that should not change over time if you sum up everything, because our energy is conserved within our closed box. And then the third thing is, I think you all know this, um, if you have like a small mass um, with a certain velocity, a very high velocity in this case, and it bumps into someone very large. What happens? Well, you get a very small velocity in this large body, and the smaller mass stops. And the principle here is that in momentum is conserved, meaning that the velocity times the mass of one object is the same as then later for the other one, but since it's larger, this product has to be the same. That doesn't change. And we have also to, uh, uh, like, in our simulations, to obey these rules. And we have to, to code that in so that we have physics in them. So you, you say, okay, this is really simple, these rules, right? But actually, well, it's not quite as simple. <laughs> so this is the Navier-Stokes equations a very complicated equation, it's not completely solved, and we have here um, all that is marked red are derivatives. Here we have our conservation law. That was the nice and simple part, but now we have to take other uh, physical things in 
uh, into accounting for pressure, accounting for viscosity, uh, for compression, so squeezing, and like how sticky is our fluid, and also gravity. So we have a lot of additional factors, additional physics we also have to get in somehow, and all of these also depend somehow on the change of position or the change of time. And these derivatives aren't really nice uh, for our computers because they, well, they don't understand this triangle. So we need to find a way to write an algorithm so that it can somehow relate with this math formula in a way that the computer likes. Um, one of the um, way to do is, um, is well, the, the simplest solution actually is just we say, okay, we have now this, this nasty um, uh, derivatives and we want to get rid of them. So if we look just at one box now, um, we say that in this box, the new value for the density in this box would be the previous density plus the flux in and out times the time step over which we measured this flux, right? Um, so, and we have to somehow get to this flux and we just say, okay, this flux now is, uh, if we start here, um, the slope of this curve, the trend, so to say, uh, where this curve is going right now, so it would look like this. So in our next step, time step, we would uh, have a density down here. Um, and, well, then we do this again. We again look at this point, where's the trend going, where's the line uh, uh, going, and then we end up here, same here. So again, um, we just try to find this flux, and this is the trend at this position in time. So this goes up here, and then if we are here now, look at this point, it should go up here. So this is what our next trend would be. And we do this over all the times, and this is how our simulation then would calculate the density uh, for one box over at different time steps. So that kind of works. So the, the blue curve is the analytical one. The red curve, well, it's kind of similar. It works. But can we do better? It's, it's not perfect yet, right? So uh, what we can do is we refine this a bit, taking a few more steps, making it a bit more computationally heavy, but trying to get a better resolution. So. First, we start with the same thing as before. We go to this point, find the trend in this point. That point, like the line would go in this direction from this point. And then we go just half a step now. Sorry. And now we look at this half a step to this point now and do again the same saying, okay, where's the trend going now? And then we take where this point would go and um, add it to this trend. So that would be that the average of this trend, of this exact point, and this trend, this dark orange curve. And then we go back to the beginning with this trend now and say this is a better trend than the one we had before. We now use that and go again and, and search the point at the, for a half a time step. And then again, we do the same thing. Now we um, again try to find actually the trend and uh, average it with the arrow before. So it's not exactly the trend, it's a bit below the trend because we averaged it with the arrow before. And now we take this averaging trend from the beginning to the top, like this. Okay, this is already quite good, but we can still do a little bit better if we average it with our ending point. So we go here, look where is the trend going, that would go quite up, like this, and we average this and this together, and then we end up with a line like this. This is so much better than what we had before. It's a bit more complicated, to be fair, 
but actually uh, it's almost on the line, so this is what we wanted. So if we compare both of them, we have here our analytical curve, so over time in one box, this is how the density should increase, and now with the bo both of the numerical method, the difference looks like this. So if we have uh, smaller and smaller time steps, even the Euler gets closer and closer to the curve, but actually the Runge Kutta, the, this four-step um, process works much better and much faster, however it's a bit more computationally um, difficult. When we simulate objects in astronomy, we always want to compare them to objects that are really out there. So this is a giant telescope, well, consisting of a lot of small telescopes, but they can be connected and used as a giant telescope. And it takes photos of dust in the sky, and this is used to take images of disks around stars, and these disks look like this. So these images were taken last year, and they are really cool. Before we had those images, we only had images with less resolution, so they were just blurred blobs. And we could say, yeah, that might be a disk, but now we really see the disks. And we see rings here, thin rings, and we see thicker rings over here, and even some spirally structures here, and also some features that are not really radially symmetric, like this arc here. And it's not completely solved how these structures formed. And to, to find that out, a colleague of mine took this little as, um, object with, with the asymmetry here. And so this is the image we just saw, and this is his simulation. So this is how the disk looked like in the beginning, probably. And he put in three planets, and let the simulation run. And so what we see here is that the star is cut out. As Anna said, we have to, so the grid cells in the, in the inner part are very, very small, and it would take a lot of time to compute them all. So that's why we're, um, we are leaving out that spot in the middle. And what we see here is three planets interacting with the material in the disk. And we can see that these planets can, can, can make this thing here appear, so that, that in the end we have something looking very similar to what we want to have, or what we, what, what we really observe. So we can say three planets could explain how these structures formed in this disk. It's a little bit elliptical, you see that. That's because it's tilted from our side of line. It, it would be round if we watched at it face on, but it's a little bit tilted. That's why it looks elliptical. So we already saw we can put planets in the gas and then we create structures. Um, one very exciting thing that we found in the last year, uh, or Two years ago it started, but then we found more, is this system, PDS-70. In this system, for the very first time, we found a planet that was still embedded with, completely within the, the, the disk, so the gas and dust, uh, usually because uh, the gas and dust is the main thing that creates um, a signal, some radiation because of heat. Uh, we only observe that, and then we can't observe the, the planet embedded. But in this case, the planet was large enough and in the right position that we actually were able to observe some signature of accretion on this planet that was brighter than the, the rest of the disk. And uh, then later, just this year, just a few months ago, we actually found out, well, this is not the only object here. So this is a very clearly a planet, but actually, like, this spot here is also something. So it's, we can see it in different um, grains, like, 
Every picture here is a different set of grains observed, and we can see this in four, four different, five different um, kinds of observation. So there is a planet here, and then there's also something, we don't know what it is yet, but it's point-like and actually creates a feature that we reproduce in different kinds of observational bands or uh, different kinds of um, uh, signals here. And this is very interesting. Uh, for the first time, we actually see a planet forming right now within the disk. Um, so a colleague of mine also is very interested in the system and, and started to simulate how, does, uh, how do two planets in a disk change the dynamics of uh, a disk. So here we have, of course, this disk is a again tilted because it's not phase on, it's, it's like 45 degrees tilted, um, like not like this, but like this. And so he had it phase on. So this is what his simulation looks like. So there are two planets that these blobs here again, as in the simulation. Uh, here we have, we have a close up. You can actually see this little. Um, boxes are actually our simulation boxes in which we um, have our densities. And then he just looked at how the planets would change the structure in the gas and also how the gas would interact with the planets shifting them around. And it's, it's interesting, so the planets tend to clear out an area, open a gap within the disk, a block a, a lot of gas around here, so you have a brighter ring here again, and then uh, clearing out more and more. And at some point in the simulation, he saw they get a bit um, jumpy. <laughs> so it's very nice. You also see that the planets uh, induce in the whole disk some kind of features, like like spiral features. And so a, a single planet will change the symmetry and the appearance of a whole disk. So the reason why the planet is staying at this point is that because we're rotating with the planet, so it's actually going around the disk, but the like camera is um, rotating with the planet, so it's staying at the fixed place we put it in. Exactly. So. Um, but there's more, because as I already said in the Navier-Stokes equation, we have a lot of different kinds of physics that we all have to include in our simulations. One of the things, of course, is we maybe don't have just a star and a disk, we have planets in there, and maybe two stars in there, and all of these larger bodies have also an interaction between each other. So if we have a star, uh, every planet will have an interaction with the star, of course, but then also the planets between each other, they have also an interaction, right? So in the end, you have to take into account oops, um, all, <laughs> um, all of these, these interactions. And then also we have accretion, just looking like this. <laughs> um, no. So m accretion means uh, that the gas um, is um, bound by some object. It can be the disk, the planet, or the star that takes up um, the mass, the dust, or the gas, and, and bounds it to this object. And then uh, it's lost to the, the, the disk or this, uh, the other structures because it's completely bound to that. So. Um, the principle of this would be um, a simulation I did uh, last year and published. We have here a binary star, so these two spot, uh, dots are stars. I kind of kept them in the same spot, They, but um, every picture will be one orbit of this binary, but since we have interactions, you actually see them rotating because of the interactions which is other. And then also we have here a planet and here a planet. And the interesting thing was that these two planets interact in such a way that they end up on exactly the same orbit. So one starts further out, the orange one, and then very fast they go in and they end up on exactly the same orbit if it now would <laughs> play nicely. Um, 
Yes, but okay. So another thing is with the accretion here, we actually see clouds from above dropping down onto the new forming star here. So all of this, what you see here, would be ga uh, gas, hydrogen, and it's a very early phase, so the disk is not completely flat. It has a lot of material, and then you actually have this info from above towards um, the star, and then the star keeps the mass. And we have to take this also into account in our simulations. Another thing uh, we have to take into account, up till now we just cared about masses and densities, but of course um, what we actually see is that stars are kind of warm, hopefully, otherwise temperatures here would also not be nice. Um, and different uh, chemicals have different uh, condensation points. And this is also true in a, a system. So we, we start with the star temperature. Uh, uh, at the surface of the star, we have a temperature around 4,000 Kelvin. And then we go a bit into the disk, and there's a point where we, for the first time, reach a point where we have any material at all, because it starts to condensate, and we actually have something solid, like iron, for example, at uh, 1,500 Kelvin. And then if we go further in, we reach a point where we have uh, solid water, and this is at, at 200 Kelvin. This is what we then would need, actually, to have a planet that also has water on it, because if we don't get the water uh, in the solid state, it will not fall onto a terrestrial planet and be bound there, right? So this is important for our Earth, actually. And then if we go even further out, we have also other gases um, condensating to solids like CO2 or methane or things like that. And since we only get water on a planet when we have a temperature that is low enough so that the water actually uh, forms a solid, um, it's important for us to think about uh, where that is in our forming disk. Where do we start to have a planet like Earth that could have some water, right? But it's not just the simple picture where we have all these nice ring structures where we have a clear line, actually. It gets more complicated because we have pressure and shocks. And thermodynamics is a lot like pogo dancing, right? You crash into each other and it's all about collisions. So the gas temperature is determined by the speed of your gas molecules, like here, bouncing and crashing into each other, exchanging momentum. So there's two ways to heat up such, such a dance. First thing is you get a large amount of velocity from the outside, like a huge kick, a shock into your system. A second way would be if we have a higher pressure, like more molecules, then also you, of course, have more collisions and then a higher temperature. So if you change, because you have a planet now in the system, the pressure at some point, you actually get a higher temperature. So that is uh, not, then we lose this nice line because suddenly we have different, um, uh, different uh, uh, pressures at different locations. And a colleague of mine also simulated this, so it, it starts as ninth. So this is the initial condition. We just assumed, okay, if we have no disturbance whatsoever, we have our nice planet here at 1 AU, so same distance as Earth to the Sun, um, here too, but here we assume that la less, um, uh, less heat gets transferred from the surface of the disk. And here we have a planet far out like Jupiter or something. And now we actually let this planet change the structure of the disk. And what happens is we form these spirals. And within these spirals, we change pressure. And with this, actually, if you see this orange everywhere where it's orange, uh, it's hotter than the ice line. So we don't have water where it's orange. 
and where it's blue, we can have water. And the interesting thing is, even if we put a planet out here, like Jupiter, we still form these regions in the inner system where we have less water. Um, One problem in astrophysical simulations is that we don't always know how to how to shape our boxes or how to um, or how how small these boxes have to be. So we use a trick to reshape the boxes as we need them. It's called adaptive mesh, and this is a simulation of a the red flowing, fluid flowing in this direction and the blue fluid in the other one. So at the boundary, it the, the two fluids shear, and they mix up somehow, and we don't know how in advance. So we start a simulation, and as the simulation starts, we reshape those boxes here. So in the middle, we don't need much re reshape because it's not that complicated here, it's just a flow. But at the boundary, we see those mixing up of the two fluids. And so we reshape the cells as we need them. This is done in, some, in, in a program, in an astrophysical program called ARIPU. We will later show you some more programs to, to use for simulations. But another simulation I want to show you first is also done with ARIPU, and it's a simulation of the universe. So from here to here, it's very big. It's a 30 million light years. So each of these dots you see here is the size of a galaxy or even more. And here you can actually see that at some regions it's very empty. So we're, we're rotating around this uni universe, this simulated universe here. And these regions here are empty and we don't need a lot of boxes there. The big boxes are enough here. But in these dense regions where we have a lot of material, we need smaller boxes. And this is this method I showed you, where we reshape the boxes as we need them, is used for this simulation. So actually you see, it's all the, the beginning of the universe there, basically. Yes. The initial mass collapsing to the first galaxies and first supernovae starting. Um, very beautiful uh, simulation. Okay. So there are different programs, as I already mentioned, in astrophysics. Three of them, those three are all open source, so you can download them and use them on your own machine if you like. And But there are more, a lot more. Some of them open source, some of them are not. It's, sometimes it's hard to, to get them. Um, we will, in the following, we will present the two, Fargo 3D and Pluto, in a detailed version or a more, more detailed version than a repo, because yeah, we usually, yeah, we usually use the, those two for our simulations. What I want to show you with this slide is that it, depending on what you want to simulate, you need to choose a different program. And one thing is that in astrophysics, we sometimes call a, the whole program code. So if I use the word code, sorry about that, it's, I mean the whole program. So. Let's have a look at Fargo 3D. It's a hydrodynamics code, and what you see here is an input parameter file. Th there you define how the disk looks like, what, how much mass does it have, how big is it, and what planet. So here a Jupiter, do you see that? A Jupiter is put in. Um, and we also define how, our, how big our boxes are. This program is written in C, which is quite nice because a lot of astrophysical programs are still written in Fortran. So <laughs> this is good for me because I don't know any Fortran. Um, we can run this. And what's typical for Fargo, so that's a compilation. 
actually on my computer, so I don't need a fancy computer, I just did it on my small laptop. And now we run it. And now, typical for Fargo, as you will see, are a lot of dots. So here, it will print out a lot of dots. And it will create, at certain times, some outputs. And these outputs are huge files containing numbers. So if you look at them, they are not really interesting. They just are numbers in something like a text file. So a big part of astrophysics is also to visualize the data, not only to create it, but also to make images so that we can make movies out of them. For that, I prefer to use Python, but there are a lot of tools, Python, Matplotlib, but there are a lot of different tools to, to visualize the data. So this is actually that output, that first one we just saw, uh, the Jupiter planet in the disk that I defined in this parameter file. And it's already started to do some spirals. And if I would have let, of, let it run further, then it, the spirals were more prominent. And yeah, now we have a planet here on our computer. Okay, so um, we also have Pluto. Pluto somehow is a bit, um, has a bit more setup files, so uh, what I need is three files here. Looks a bit complicated to break it down. This file defines my grid and initial values, some, and the simulation time here we input actually what physics do we want to need, what is our co uh, coordinate system, so do we want to have a disk or just like s um, spherical boxes or like uh, squared boxes and how is the time defined. And here we then actually write a bit of code to say, okay, now how do I want a gravitational potential, so what's the source um, of gravity, or what will happen at the inner region where we have this dark spot. We have somehow to define what happens if gas reaches this boundary. Is it just falling in? Is it bouncing back or something? Or is it looping through the one end to the next? Um, this is also something we then just have to code in. And if we then make it and let it run, it looks like this. So, um, Again, our nice um, the thing we hopefully put in or wanted to put in, the time steps, what our boundaries were, parameters of uh, physics, hopefully the right ones, and then nicely we start with our time steps. And if we see this, it's hooray, it worked actually, because it's actually not quite simple usually to set up a, a running program, a running problem, because you have to really think about what should be the physics, what's the uh, scale of your problem, what's the time scale of your problem, and, and specify this in a good way. But in principle, this is how it works. Uh, there are a few test problems if you actually want to play around with this um, to make it easy for the beginning. Um, and this is how we do simulations. So, as already said, we can just start them on our laptop. So here, this is my laptop. I just type uh, dot slash Fargo 3D and it should run, right? And then I just wait for 10 years to finish the simulations of 500 time steps or something, or like 500 out outputs. Well, that's not the best idea, so we need more power. And um, both of us, for example, are using um, a cluster for Baden-Württemberg, um, and that takes down our computation time by a lot, uh, usually like a factor of um, maybe 20 which is a lot, so I, I would need on my computer maybe a year, and then I just need maybe five hours, a few days, uh, or a week on this cluster, which is usually the simulation time, about a week for me. Um, 
So what and you see here yeah. is that we use GPUs, yes, but we do not, or mostly, not use them for gaming. <laughs> we use them for actual, actual science. Um, yeah, would be nice to play on that, right? But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that just, just said. So back to our Earth, actually. So can we now? We wanted to grow our own planet. We can do that, yes, of course. Can we grow Earth? Well, Earth is a very special planet. We have a very nice temperature here, right? And we have not a crushing atmosphere like Jupiter, like a huge planet that we could not live under. We have a magnetic field that shields us from um, the radiation from space, and we have water, but just enough water so that we still have land on this planet where we can live on. So even if we fine-tune our simulations, the probability that we actually hit Earth and have the, all the parameters right is actually tiny. It's not that easy to simulate an Earth. So, And there are a lot of open questions too. How did we actually manage to get just this sip of water on our surface? How did we manage to collide enough mass or aggregate enough mass to form this terrestrial planet without Jupiter sweeping out all the mass in our system? How could we be stable in this orbit when there are seven other planets swirling around and interacting with us? All of this is uh, open in our field of research, actually, and not completely understood. This is the reason why we still need to do astrophysics. And even in all our simulations, there is no planet B, and the Earth is quite unique and perfect for uh, human life. So please take care of the Earth, and take care of yourself, and of all the other people on the Congress. And thank you for listening. And thank you to everyone who helped us make this possible, and to the people who actually coded um, our programs with which we simulate. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful talk and for the message at the end. Um, the the paper is open for discussion, so if you guys have any questions, please come to the microphones. Um, I'm asking my signal angel. No questions right now, but microphone two, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Very beautiful talk. I can agree. Um, I have two questions. The first is um, you showed you are using Navier-Stokes equation, but um, you have uh, on the one hand you have the dust uh, disk, and on the other hand you have solid planets in it. And so, yes. are you using the same description for both, or is it uh, hybrid? It it it, de it very much depends. Like uh, the, this is one of the things I showed you that for Pluto we write this C file mm. uh, that specifies some things and. And uh, about every physicist has somewhat his or her own version of things. Um, so some, usually the planets, if they are large, they will be put in as um, a gravity source and possibly one that can accrete. And pebbles are usually then put in in a different way. However, also pebbles... Uh, are at the moment a bit complicated. There are special groups specializing in understanding pebbles because, um, as we said in the beginning, um, when they collide, usually they should be destroyed. If you hit two rocks very hard together, they, or two rocks together, they don't stick. If you hit them hard together, they splatter around, and we don't add up with Just bigger to objects. explain, yeah. pe pebbles are small rocks, or like big sandstones or something like that. Yeah, so bigger bigger rocks, but not very big uh, yet. So, yeah. Yes, so... It depends on which code you use, yes. Okay, I think. A very short, maybe one. Do yes. you also need to include relativistic effects, or is that completely out? Um, it's a good question. Um, mostly, um, if you have a um, solar-type system, uh, you're in a range where it, this is not necessary. 
For example, with the binaries, if they get very close together, then at the inner part of the disk, that is something we could consider. And actually, I know for Pluto, it has modules to include relativistic physics too. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we have quite some questions, so keep them short. Number one, please. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, I think you had it on your very first slide that uh, about 70% of the universe consists of dark matter and energy. Is that somehow considered in your simulations or um, how do you handle this? Well, in the simulations we make, we, we are doing planets and disks around stars. It's not considered there. Um, in this simulation we showed you about the universe, at the beginning the bluish things were all dark matter, so that was included in there. Okay, thank you. Okay, microphone three. Oh, hi, thanks. <clears throat> Sorry, I think you talked about three different programs, I think Pluto, Fargo 3D, and a third one. I was wondering, say you're a complete beginner, which program would you suggest is like you more use, like if you want to learn more, which one is user friendly or good to I start would with? I would suggest Fargo first. It's uh, kind of user friendly, has uh, somewhat good support, and they are always also always very uh, thankful for actual comments and um, additions if, if people actually are engaged in trying to improve on that because we are physicists, we're not perfect programmers, and we're all, all also happy to learn more. So yeah, Fargo, I would, I would suggest it has some easy ways of testing some systems and getting something yeah. done. And it also has a very good documentation and also an, yeah, a manual how to make the first steps on the internet. So you can look that up. Awesome. Thank you. Let's get one question from outside from my signal angel. Thank you for your talk. Um, there's one question from ISC. How do you know your model is good and when you can only observe snapshots? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> we, all, we have to, as we said, we're in theoretical astrophysics, so there are theoretical models and these models cannot include everything, so every single process, it's not possible because then we would calculate for years in, in um, yeah, to, to know if a model is good, you have to... Usually you have a hypothesis or um, an observation that you somehow want to understand with most of the necessary physics at the stage to reproduce this image. So... Um, also, from the observation, we have to take into account what our parameters kind of should be, how dense the end of the simulation should be, and things like this. So, uh, by comparing two observations, that's the best measure we can get if uh, we um, kind of agree. Uh, of course, if we do something completely wrong, then it will just blow up or we will get a horribly high density, so this is how we know. Um, it's, uh, physics will just go crazy yeah, if we do too, too large mistakes. Otherwise, we would try to compare to observations that it actually is sensible what we did. Yeah, that's one of the most complicated tasks to include just enough physics that the system is represented in, in, in a good enough way, but not yeah, so, but not too much that our simulation would blow up in time. Uh, number two, please. Um, I've got a question about the adapted grids. How does the computer decide how to adapt the grid? Because the data where the high density comes after making the grid. Yes. I understand right. um, this is actually quite an, uh, uh, interesting and also not quite easy to answer question. Let, let me try to give a, 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 a breakdown nutshell answer here. Um, the, the thing is you measure and uh, evaluate uh, the velocities or in the flux you also evaluate the velocity. And if the velocity goes high, you know there's ha a lot happening, so we need a smaller grid than there. So we try to create more grid cells where we have a higher velocity. In a nutshell, this is of course in an algorithm 
a bit harder to, to actually achieve, but this is the idea. We measure the velocities at each point, and then if we measure a high velocity, we change to a smaller grid. So you can predict where the mass will go and where the densities are getting high. Exactly, step by step, okay. so to say. Thanks. We stay with microphone two. Okay, I've got a bit of a classical question. So I guess a lot relies on your initial conditions, and I have two yes. questions related to that. So first, um, I guess they are inspired by observations. What are the uncertainties that you have? Um, B, then, what is the impact if you change your initial conditions, like the density in the disk? Yeah, I'm, I, right now, my main um, research is actually figuring out uh, sensible initial conditions or parameters for a disk. Um, if you just let a, have an initial set of conditions and a sensible set of parameters and let it run very long, you expect a system hopefully to converge to the state that it should be in. But your parameters are, of course, very important. Um, here we go back to what we can actually understand from observations. Um, what we need, for example, is the, the d density, for example, and that is something we try to estimate from the light we see in these disks that you saw in this nice grid with all these disks. We estimate, okay, what's the average um, light there, what should then be the average densities of dust and gas in comparable disks. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, one more at number two. Yes, thank you for the talk. Um, <coughs> when you increase the, the detail on the grid in the Euler model, um, you have to, when, when you want to compute the the, the gravitational force in one cell, you have to sum the, all the masses from the, all the other cells, so the complexity of the calculus grows yes. uh, quadratically at the square of the... How do you solve that? Yes, or do that you just put more CPUs? <laughs> well, that would be one way to do that, but um, you, there are ways to simplify if you have a lot of particles in one direction and they are far away from the object you're looking at. Um, so, yeah. So if you have several balls here and one ball here, then you can include all these balls or you can, you can f think of them as one ball. So um, it depends on you look at so so how you def define how how many particles you can take together is when you look at the angle of this um, of of the yeah the 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 big or, or the, the many particles will have from seen from the object you're looking at and you can define a critical angle and it, if it's if an object gets smaller than this, or if a lot of objects get smaller than this angle, you can just say, okay, that's one object. So that's a way to simplify this method. And there are some, yeah, I think that's the main idea. Okay, we have another one. Um, do you have a strategy to check if um, the simulation will give a valuable uh, solution? Or does it happen a lot that you wait one week for the calculation and find out, okay, it's total crash, that trash, or it crashed in the time. So that also depends on the program you're using. So in Fargo, it gives these outputs at, after a, sp a certain amount of uh, calculation steps, and you can already look at those outputs before the simulation is finished. So that would be a way to to control if it's really working. Um, yeah, but I think it's the same for Pluto. So you, you get every, every you set, um, there's a difference between time steps and actually output steps. So, and you define your output steps not um, as the whole simulation, but you can look at each output step um, as soon as it's produced. So I usually get like 500 outputs, but I already can look at the first and second after maybe half an hour or something like that. Yeah, but it also happens that you start a simulation and wait and wait and wait and then see you put something wrong in there and, well, then you have to do it again. So this happens as well. Thanks. Okay, one final question. 
Yeah, okay. Um, is there a, pr uh, a program uh, in which you can calculate it backwards, so uh, that you don't have the uh, starting conditions, but the, the ending conditions, and you can calculate how it had uh, started? Um, not for hydrodynamics. If you go to N-body, um, there is a way to go backwards in time, but for hydrodynamics, the thing is that you have um, turbulent, uh, almost like chaotic uh, conditions, so you, you cannot really turn them back in time. Um, with anybody, you cannot, because actually it's kind of, uh, well, it's not analytically solved, but it's much closer than like uh, turbulences, streams, um, spirals, and all the things you, you saw in the simulations. Okay, I guess that brings us to the end of the talk and of the session. Thank you for the discussion and of course thank you guys for the presentation.